one of the steps in the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation is to contemplate in constancy as you breathe in breathe out. And then the next step is to contemplate dispassion as you breathe in and breathe out. The question is, how do you get from A to B? Is it automatic that when you see that things are inconstant that you develop dispassion for them? In a few cases, yes. But in a lot of cases, no. It's not automatic. You have to go through several intermediate stages. It's not the case that all our defilements and all our problems are based on the idea that we think that things are permanent. There are a lot of things that we know are impermanent, and we still go for them. I mean, just look at the houses built on the cliffs overlooking the Pacific Ocean. We've seen many houses slide down the hills and on TV, but yet people still build houses on the hills, and they still slide. It's because the hillsides have an allure. There's something people like about having a house on the hillside, and they're willing to pay the price or take the gamble. That's where our, our real attachments are. And it's not the case that you wait till the very end of your meditation after your concentration powers have been fully developed that you start thinking in these terms. You've got things interfering with your practice all the time that you've got to learn how to look at and get some dispassion for. You start out by seeing how inconstant the desire to do those things is. It's there, and sometimes, and sometimes it's there, and sometimes it's not. It comes and it goes. You look at the inconstancy not just to see, oh yeah, it comes and goes, but you want to see what comes along with it and what goes with it. In other words, when it comes, why do you jump on it? There's an analysis the Buddha has. You, to understand things, you have to see them arise and pass away. You have to see their allure and their drawbacks, and then the escape. Now, the arising and passing away is the inconstancy, and the escape is the dispassion. It's those intermediate steps, seeing the allure and seeing the drawbacks. That's where you have to do your work. In other words, a particular defilement comes up, say greed comes up, or anger comes up, or a particularly bad habit you have comes up. You want to see when it comes. Why is there the urge to do this? What sparks the urge? What do you like about this? We are so protective of our, our defilements. People come up with all kinds of excuses, saying, well, I've got this defilement, and um, you're going to have to just excuse me because I'm going to stick with this defilement. It's like little animals that we try to protect. You have to ask yourself, why do you want to stick with it? What pleasure do you get out of it? That old attitude, love me, love my defilements. It's really deeply entrenched, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Because you have to remember, as the Buddha said, aging is going to happen, illness is going to happen, death is going to happen, and with death you don't know when it's going to happen. It can come at any time. He says your proper attitude towards your defilement should be you see you've got one and you want to put it out as quickly as possible. It's as if your head were on fire. He says, use all your mindfulness. And it's interesting, he uses the word mindfulness here. Obviously it does not mean just accepting things as they are or watching them come and go without reacting. You use your mindfulness, i.e. your ability to remember that something unskillful is coming in the mind and you don't want it. You don't want it to have power over you. So you want to see what, what is the power. You have to understand the power. Many times it's something that we don't like to admit to ourselves, which is why we can't get rid of the habit. Because we often find our pleasure in things that are not all that inspiring, and we don't want other people to look too carefully at it, and we ourselves don't want to look too carefully at it. It's embarrassing. And so we come, we come up with our excuses for holding on. 
But then we're still suffering. We're still making other people suffer, too. And the question is, how much longer do you want an extension on this particular defilement? How much longer do you want your, your hair to be on fire? Because what happens when your hair is on fire? You're not the only one who's on fire. It sets fire to other people, too. So when something comes like this, you want to see, where's the allure? What do I like about this? And one of the best ways of finding the allure is to tell yourself, I'm not going to go with it. Because the mind is immediately going to rebel. And as it rebels, that's when you get to see it. So it's not the case that you just kind of let it go, let it go, let it go for a while until you feel more inclined to deal with it. You've got to stop it as quickly as possible and say, this is, this is where I draw the line. And see what part of the mind objects. What is it missing? What is it going to be lacking if it can't give in to that particular kind of greed or lust or aversion, delusion, whatever? And then when you see the actual lure, why you went for it, then you can compare that with the drawbacks. Because often we do know some of the drawbacks, but the lure is hidden. And because it's hidden, it seems to be a lot larger than it really is, a lot more worthy of holding on to. What this means, of course, is that you have to be an adult around your defilements. You can't the little, little children's voices inside say, well, I'm a little child and this is how my little child feels. As this little children deserve to live on for another 50, 60, 70 years. It's not the case that the child is totally innocent and then it was hor this horrible society that made it into a warped being. And we come into, into life with a lot of defilements, fully ready to take over as soon as we we learn how to use our bodies and think a little bit more clearly. Our defilements move right in. They're already there, waiting for their equipment to get stronger. And they pick up where they left off from the last time around. It's not, it's not the case that our childhood habits, our inner child's children are innocent, and they should be, or that should be given special treatment. Right? If you can't outsmart your inner child, you're still not fully an adult. That's the attitude you've got to have. So you've got to look at the Lord and see what it actually is. And then you can compare it with the, the drawbacks. And that's when you can develop some dispassion. You see that the drawbacks way outweigh the allure. Now it's high time that you stopped going for the allure. If you put two of them together right next to each other, that's when you see clearly that you really don't want this. There's that famous case where the monk had this vision of a courtesan standing in front of him saying, Why are you wasting your youth? Let's enjoy ourselves together, and then, then when we're old, then we can go forth. And he looked at her and realized suddenly this was a trap of death laid out. The allure of the body. He saw it compared immediately. It has to go with death. We don't usually put the two of those together, but that's what he put together. And that was it. I was able to get past that particular defilement. So you have to put them together in strong terms. This is the allure, but this is the drawback. You know, there's a lure with, with anger. There's a certain amount of sense of freedom that we get to say what we want or do what we want. And we feel that we have an excuse because it's, we've been overpowered by the anger and the situation is really bad and we, we have every right to express our anger. But if you can see the damage that that does to the mind really clearly. And you realize that the allure is nothing. It's un the mind is lying to itself. And once you see that the allure is a lie, okay, then you can develop dispassion. And the dispassion here comes not with a sense of 
missing it or regretting that you have to let it go. It's more like growing up or getting past a bout of intoxication. You suddenly sober up. Things are, are a lot clearer. You're released from the power of the allure. And that's why the Buddha says that dispassion is an escape. You're getting out of a prison, the prison of your own defilements. So these are the steps when you're going from seeing inconstancy to seeing dispassion. It's not simply realizing that the world has things that change. I mean, everybody knows that. And yet we still go for the changing things. And the problem is not with the fact that things change. The problem is that certain things are really unskillful and we go for them. Even though we should know better. So it's in seeing when these things come and when they go looking into the specifics of their inconstancy. It's not just a general principle. Watching for the allure that's going to kick in as soon as something arises that makes you go with it. Or the fact that you've suddenly, for a little while at least, grown tired of the allure and you've dropped it. That's why you want to look at the coming and going. Look for the specifics. That's when you can start making comparisons in the inner mind to see that it's not worth building your house on that hillside. It's going to go sliding down. There are a lot safer places to build your house. Choose those instead.